We're in uh, John chapter 3. If you have a Bible, please open to uh, verses 19, 20, and 21. There's an outline on the back of the, or inside the bulletin, and there are uh, printed messages at both exits and online, and also the audio online as well. And um, many of my sermons are now on Bible.org, if you're familiar with that website and you go to it. There's lots of uh, Bible study uh, resources there, and uh, they're putting a lot of my messages on that site as well, so you can access that. I'm uh, reading from the New American Standard Bible. John says, this is the judgment, and uh, going back to verse 18, he who believes in him is not judged, he who does not believe has been judged already, because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and that men loved the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Picture a guy who's uh, floating downstream on a warm summer day on a on a river and he's having the time of his life. He's enjoying the cool breeze and the water splashing on him as he's floating down this uh, stream. And you're on the shore and you know something he doesn't know. And that is that just downstream beyond him is a dangerous and even fatal waterfall. So this guy is floating blissfully and ignorantly towards certain destruction. You frantically yell at him, wave your arms, throw him a rope, and he looks and waves at you and ignores the rope and floats on down to what you know will be certain death. Now, why won't he grab the life preserver that you have thrown? Well, probably a couple of answers. Number one, he really loves what he's doing. And number two, he just flat out doesn't believe you because he loves what he's doing. He doesn't believe what you're warning him about. Now, why do people reject God's wonderful offer of salvation through Jesus Christ? You would think that everyone would eagerly grab the life preserver that God has graciously thrown out in the gospel. We saw that last week in John 3:16. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I mean, after a verse like that, you have to ask, why would anyone choose to perish? Why would everyone not just be saying, here, here, and grabbing for the life preserver that God has thrown out? Why would anyone continue heading downstream toward eternal destruction. And in our text, John shows us that people reject Christ because they love their sin and they hate having it exposed by God's light. They, they don't want God interfering in what they consider to be a good time that they're having in life without God. And because of that, they don't believe the many warnings in Scripture that they're under God's judgment now and that they will face God's judgment eternally if they die in their present condition. And people think that, well, they're basically good and that God is going to be um, understanding of their faults and overlook them and that when all is said and done, their good deeds are going to outweigh their bad deeds and God will let them into heaven someday. And so they don't repent of their sin. They don't believe in Jesus Christ as their only hope to save them from God's judgment. The Greek philosopher Plato, who of course was not a believer, but he, he observed, we can easily forgive a child who's afraid of the dark, 
The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. And that's the situation we see here in our text of people who are afraid of the light. They don't want to go near the light. And John makes four points here for our consideration. First of all, he shows that the light came into this world in the person of Jesus Christ and that his very presence condemned those who were in darkness. I'm focusing here on the first half of verse 19. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. Now John has already introduced Jesus to us as the light in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 1 where he said, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it or overtake it. Um, then later, in chapter 8, verse 12, we will see, and Jesus repeats this, that he, he claims to be the light of the world two other times, in chapter 9 and then in chapter 12. But in 8, 12, he says, I am the light of the world. Uh, by the way, people who deny the deity of Jesus, how can anybody who is not God say, I am the light of the world? If he is not wacko, he certainly is making an astounding claim to be the light of the world. Uh, and then Jesus says, he who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, in the Bible, light is used symbolically in two main ways. First of all, light refers to God's absolute holiness, and then by extension also to the holiness that uh, should characterize God's people. And darkness, of course, symbolizes Satan's domain and sin. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.16 that God dwells in unapproachable light. He's speaking there of the splendor of God's holiness that is, is just, you can't even get near it. In uh, 1 John 1, 5, the apostle de declares, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And the, the Greek is very emphatic on that last phrase, not even a little bit of darkness. And then, referring to God's people, in the same vein, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 7 through 10, Therefore do not be partakers with them, that is, with those whose deeds are evil and dark. He adds, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And so the first way, and I could have multiplied many examples, that light is used in the Bible is to refer to God's holiness and by extension to the holiness of us, his people. A second way that light is used symbolically then is to refer to the spiritual illumination or understanding that we get when we are born again. And of course, darkness refers to our natural spiritual blindness before we are saved. And again, I could have gone to many references, but here's one that combines both the darkness and light themes. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and then verse 6, Paul says, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world, referring to Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. And then jumping down to verse 6, he says, For God, who said light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. And so he's talking about spiritual illumination that God gives compared to blindness and those of us who see. And in that sense, the psalmist in Psalm 119, a very familiar verse, verse 105 says, God's word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Or Proverbs 6:23 says, for the commandment is a lamp 
and the teaching is a light or is light and reproofs for discipline are a way or the way of life so the idea is God's word then gives us spiritual light so that we understand the truth now of who God is and how God wants us to live God's light John is saying in our text is embodied in Jesus Christ uh, who, who is of course the eternal Son of God who took on human flesh back in John 1 9 we saw John said there was the true light referring to Jesus which coming into the world enlightens every man he means that when Jesus came into the world his very presence exposed the world to who God is as holy and to the fact that we are not holy. Um, D.A. Carson explains John 1.9 as follows. He says, It, meaning the light, shines on every man and divides the race. Those who hate the light respond as the world does. They flee, lest their deeds should be exposed by this light. And then he references our text here. But some receive this revelation and thereby testify that their deeds have been done through God. Again, a reference to verse 21 of our text. In John's Gospel, it is repeatedly the case that the light shines on all and forces a distinction. And so, Leon Morris explains verse 19 of our text. He says, the word translated judgment here denotes the process of judging, not the sentence of condemnation. It is not God's sentence with which John is concerned here. He is telling us, rather, how the process works. Men choose the darkness, and their condemnation lies in that very fact. They refuse to be shaken out of their comfortable sinfulness. Now, we saw last time in verses 17 and 18, Jesus didn't come for the purpose of condemning people, of judging them. He came to bring light. But the very fact of who he is, when, we, when the light comes, shadows come. When Jesus comes, it, it divides people. Um, and it brings judgment to those who realize they are alienated from God. Maybe you've had the experience, most of us have, of being in the presence of a man or woman who was especially holy or godly, and you felt uncomfortable. You know, you're kind of on edge, kind of on guard. Uh, R.C. Sproul, in uh, his book, The Holiness of God, tells a story about a leading professional golfer who remains unnamed, but he was invited to play in a, a foursome with Gerald Ford, Jack Nicklaus, and Billy Graham. And uh, he had played with Nicklaus before, but he was especially in awe of playing with the president and with Billy Graham and so after the round was finished one of the other pros came up to him and asked hey what was it like playing with the president and with Billy Graham and uh, the pro unleashed a torrent of cursing and in a very disgusting manner he said I don't need Billy Graham cramming religion down my throat and with that he turned and he stormed off and went out to the practice tee his friend followed him out there and watched as the angry pro grabbed his driver and just slammed ball after ball after ball, taking out his, his anger. And uh, the friend didn't say anything. He just sat there watching until finally the uh, golf pro calmed down. And the friend said quietly to him, Was Billy a little rough on you out there? And uh, the pro heaved an embarrassed sigh and he said, uh, no, he said he didn't even mention religion. I just had a bad round. But apparently Billy Graham's presence put that golf pro on edge and made him feel condemned even when Billy didn't say a word about God. Um, how much more, I think, would we all have felt condemned to be in the very presence of Jesus Christ? Do you remember one of Peter's early encounters with Jesus? They're in the boat. He's fished all night and caught nothing. And Jesus says, put out again into the deep. He says, Master, we didn't catch anything. But all right, you say so, we'll do. So they go out and Jesus says, cast your net right here. And he does and the net nearly breaks with all the fish. And then 
And again, Jesus hasn't said anything about sin. He hasn't said anything about judgment. He hasn't said, Peter, you're a sinner. You need to repent. Nothing of that. And Peter falls down in Jesus' presence. Luke 5, 8, he says, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Isn't that interesting? Jesus didn't say anything about sin. Jesus was just there. And Peter recognizes, oh, whoa. Have you had that kind of an encounter with Jesus? Where you realize suddenly, he's holy, and I'm not holy. He is absolutely righteous, and oh my goodness, my sins are without number. Now, when you have that kind of an encounter with Jesus, there are two ways you can go. You can't be neutral. And John first presents the negative way, and then in verse 21, he'll give us the positive way. But in 19 and 20, he gives us the negative response. He shows us that people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Verse 19, second part, men loved darkness. Men is generic for people rather than light because their deeds are evil. Now that phrase teaches us several significant things about sin. First of all, we see that sin is far deeper than just outward deeds. Sin is a matter of our affections. It's a matter of our desires. It says men loved darkness. That's a word about your affections. They loved darkness. Uh, Leon Morris says the aorist tense there could be translated, men set their love on darkness. Now, loved indicates this was not a cool, rational decision where people sit down and say, you know, I've thought about righteousness and I've thought about sin and I really think sin is the better way to go. It's not that kind of a decision. It's a largely emotional decision fed by deep-seated desires that are ours by virtue of the fall. We love darkness rather than light. And that tells us a second thing about sin. And that is that our sin problem is far deeper than we ever imagined. See, the Bible doesn't teach that we're all basically good people and we just need to overcome a few flaws in our character, you know? We, we, we aren't people who just need a little bit more education on how to be better people or learn a few coping techniques or a few anger management uh, lessons so that our relationships will be a little more healthy. Uh, we don't need to go through therapy to learn about our past and how our parents treated us and that explains why we are the way we are so that we can now overcome it. All of those approaches are too superficial when it comes to dealing with the problem of our hearts. See, the Bible shows that the root problem is we love our sin. It's a heart problem. And the only remedy that goes deep enough to solve that problem is the new birth where God gives us a new heart that hungers and thirsts after righteousness, as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. But that little phrase, men love darkness rather than light, shows us a third truth about sin. And that is that the reason people reject Christ is not primarily intellectual, it is moral. They love their sin. And again, as I said, men don't love darkness rather than light because they've thought it through carefully and say, you know, I think that makes more sense. Rather, they love darkness, John says, because their deeds are evil. And the light exposes that evil and it convicts them of their true moral guilt before a holy God. And so they don't like the light. And frankly, they do like sinning. They love it. Aldous Huxley, the famous atheist of the last century who wrote Brave New World, once admitted that his rejection of Christianity stemmed from his desire to sin. He wrote this. He said, I had motives 
for not wanting the world to be to have a meaning consequently assumed that it had not and was able without any difficulty to find satisfying reasons for this assumption the philosopher who finds no meaning in this world is not concerned exclusively with the problem of pure metaphysics he is also concerned to prove that there is no valid reason why he personally should not do as he wants to for myself the philosophy of meaningless was essentially an instrument of liberation sexual and political he's saying uh, because I could assume there's no God then I can live as I want to live and that's what I wanted to do so I made that assumption and then I found all kinds of reasons to support my assumption it's a pretty amazing admission but what it means practically is this maybe you're on campus and you're sharing Christ with a PhD and that can be a little intimidating this guy you know he's smart you don't have to be intimidated by him maybe he's gonna cite you know I believe in evolution and he's a biology major or PhD and he can run circles around you scientifically or he's gonna cite evidence from the latest book by the latest popular atheist or whatever uh, you know don't panic maybe he's gonna say well I don't believe the Bible for all of its contradictions you can give philosophic arguments you can give scientific arguments you might even convince him intellectually but that doesn't deal with his root problem the root problem of every human being whether it's a primitive tribesman in Erie and Jaya or a PhD on the university campus is the same he is a sinner and he knows he's a sinner and he is condemned by the Holy God unless he repents and trusts in Jesus Christ he loves his sin he stands guilty before the judge of the universe and so I'm not saying you shouldn't understand how to answer some of these basic objections that's helpful but I am saying that's usually not going to bring him to saving faith that's not the issue and so try to go for the jugular try to zero in on his root problem and one way you can do it and I've shared this with you before is just to ask the question are you telling me that if I can give you a reasonable answer to that question that you're going to repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and I almost guarantee you you're going to hear this reply well I have other objections too so he's just dodging it's just a smokescreen to dodge the root issue is he is a sinner and he loves his sin and there is a holy God but this phrase men love darkness rather than light shows us a fourth truth about sin and that is sin what sin is must be determined by God's absolute standards of holiness and not by men's relative standards of goodness John says something rather radical here he says men's deeds are evil now when you hear that word evil you might think terrorist you know or a murderer or drug dealer or pedophile or or pimp yeah those people are evil but the average person you know my sweet little grandmother oh no she's not evil she's a good person my neighbor he's, he's a good guy well no he's not a Christian but you know they're good good people now the Bible acknowledges there are unbelievers who are relatively good people humanly speaking if it were not so the human race would have self-destructed millennia ago we would have all killed each other off and there would be no human race if everyone was as evil as their nature uh, would prompt them to be God restrains through common grace he restrains evil in several ways the law of civil government restrains evil people might want to kill their neighbor but they say oh, I'll go to jail I better not do that you know uh, so civil government there's also social disapproval what will my neighbors think the, the fear of shame uh, the desire to look good in front of others all of that but you see it's just restraining evil on the external basis the Bible tells us something very disconcerting God looks on the heart 
God knows every thought that we have before we have it. Whew. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And the Bible is clear, and you know it in your heart, that even the best of sinners are sinners. Even the best of human beings, humanly speaking, they're filled with pride and selfishness and greed and lust and many other sins of the heart that God looks on. Now, the situation of loving darkness rather than light is far worse than just loving sin. John has shown us that the light came into the world in Christ and his presence condemned those in darkness and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil but John goes a little farther when he says in the third place that those who practice evil hate Jesus who is light and they don't come to him for fear that their deeds will be exposed that's verse 20 everyone for everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And so John is saying, unbelievers don't just love their sin, the darkness. They also hate the light who is Jesus. They hate the one who left the glory of heaven and came to this evil world and suffered at the hands of sinners all of the agony of the cross so that simply by coming and believing in him they could have eternal life and they say I hate him because he exposes their evil deeds a fourth grade teacher assigned his students to write a topic sentence for the following phrases Sam always works quietly Sam is polite to the teacher Sam always does his homework the student's topic sentence, I hate Sam. <laughs> See, Sam exposes his evil deeds. Well, we need to understand several things about this verse, verse 20. First of all, John does not mean when he says that um, everyone who does evil doesn't come to the light. He doesn't mean that all sinners do all their evil deeds in secret. That's just not true. Now, many do, of course. There are many otherwise upstanding men, for example, who would not darken the door of a strip club in their hometown, but if they're traveling and they're away from people who know them and they think they're safe, then it becomes a temptation to them and they might succumb. Um, in our day, though, we have people who call good evil and evil good. And they love to go on talk TV or talk radio and talk about all of their sin and all of the sordidness of it and that kind of thing. And it's kind of cool to, to flaunt your sin in our day. And we even have in our own city and in many other cities gay pride celebrations. Uh, that is such a, a, an anomaly. They are boasting in what God condemns as an abomination, as evil. But, you know, we think it's cool, our society. And uh, so John is not saying men do all their sinning in secret. What he is saying is they do not want to come to the light, who is Jesus, because they know that Jesus would condemn their evil deeds. Secondly, here in verse 20, John does not say that those who practice evil are neutral toward Jesus, but rather he says they hate him. They hate the light. Now, many unbelievers would object at this point. They would say, wait a minute, I don't hate Jesus. You know, I'm indifferent toward the man. I mean, I think he's a good moral teacher. Uh, I think he had many good things to say. There are some who might go so far as to say, as an atheist uh, I had lunch with a couple of weeks ago told me, oh, I think he's probably an Old Testament prophet. Um, they, they feel bad that he got crucified for his teaching. They know he was a basically good man in their mind, and it's tragic that he got nailed to the cross. But they're neutral toward him. They're indifferent. But John doesn't say that. John says, no, they hate him. They hate Jesus. 
Jesus himself told his then unbelieving brothers in John 7, 7, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. That's what our verse is telling us here. And then, thirdly, John gives us the reason why unbelievers hate Jesus. He says they fear that Jesus will expose their evil deeds. Kind of like the golfer who was playing with Billy Graham. And if you've ever been around somebody who you knew was godly, you're on guard. Especially if you've got a loose tongue. You don't want to, you know, slip and say a swear word. Or you don't want to do anything that's going to expose how you really live normally. So you put on your best behavior. I mean, you're in the presence of somebody who represents God. It was really funny when I was a new pastor. First week or two, I was a pastor and uh, Marla and I were looking for a house and we went to a house that was for sale by the owner and the owner was an old codger and as he was showing us his house he was smoking a cigarette and after a while he asked me casually well what do you do and I said well I'm the new pastor of the church up there down the road you know and and uh, he got this very horrified look on his face and he grabbed his cigarette which wasn't very far smoked threw it to the ground, stomped on it, spread it around with his foot like that, and he said, oh, oh, look at me, look at me. He says, I, I'm smoking in front of a reverend. And uh, it was all I could do not to laugh. And, uh, and I thought, well, I guess he thinks smoking is a sin, and he shouldn't be doing it, but he doesn't seem to realize every time he lights up, he lights up in the presence of God, who knows everything that we are and everything that we do. Uh, The word exposed here in verse 20 is a word that means to be convicted in a court of law. It was used when an attorney proved his case. Jesus will use it in John 16, 8 when he says, When the Spirit comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. You know, uh, uh, guilty criminals hate judges that convict him. The judge didn't have anything to do with why they're in front of him. He's just doing his job. But they are guilty and they know it and they hate the law that convicts them and says, you are guilty. And guilty sinners, John is saying, hate Jesus when they realize who he is because he convicts them of their sins. So that's the negative response, is to hate Jesus, to turn from the light, to say, I don't want anything to do with it, Christianity, and walk away from the one who could literally throw them the life preserver. But John presents the positive. Thankfully, because of God's grace, not all reject Christ. And in verse 21, he shows us that true believers practice the truth. And they come to the light so that their deeds are shown uh, to have God as their source. Verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Now, John does not mean there that there are some who just have a natural bent toward the truth. uh, Or that doing so, practicing the truth brings salvation. He just made it plain in verses 1 through 16 or 1 through 18 of our text that we all need the new birth. Even the most righteous man, a good man like Nicodemus, needs the new birth and that salvation comes by believing in Jesus Christ, not by any works that we have done. What John is doing in verse 21 and in in the verses just before is describing two types of people. Uh, Those that have not believed, they reject Christ. They avoid the light. They hate the light because the light exposes their sinful deeds. Verse 21, those that have believed in Christ gladly come to Christ. They live their lives exposed to Christ. They give all credit to Christ and all glory to Christ for who they are and what he's done in their lives. And they know that their good deeds could not have come from them. Uh, but it came from Christ who caused them to be born again. Now that phrase, practicing the truth, is a a Semitic uh, uh, Hebrew expression, and it means to act faithfully or honorably. 
But it shows us something, and that is the truth is not just to be spoken. We are to live the truth. We are to live the truth. And truth is a very important concept for John. He uses the word far more than the other gospel writers, 25 times in the gospel, and then 20 more times in his three short epistles. Truth is embodied in Jesus. Remember, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then in John 18:37, Jesus told Pilate, For this I have been born, and for this I came, have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now this has two implications. First of all, we need to understand there is such a thing as absolute truth in the spiritual and moral realms, and you can spot believers by their obedience to that truth. Uh, we live in a postmodern day where everyone thinks, well, truth is just relative to the culture, or truth is relative to the situation. The Bible says no. It says that all truth is in Jesus. All truth is in God's Word. Jesus said God's Word is truth in John 17:17, 17, 17. And that means that as believers, as followers of Jesus, we are people committed to knowing the truth of God, to believing it, to following it with all of our lives. And so we seek to understand the truth. That's why we have sermons that preach the Word of God. Uh, we seek to hold to the truth even when the culture is going against it as our culture is very rapidly doing. But there's absolute right and wrong, truth and error, and that is very important that we hold on to that um, as we uh, live in this postmodern day. A second implication of um, this verse 21 is that Believers then willingly, gladly, and repeatedly come to the light of God's Word so that we can grow in holiness and give God glory for His work in our hearts. Um, that means if, if God's Word is truth, we read it over and over and over and over. I hope you do that as a habit. Read the Word of God. If you have trouble with it, get a good study Bible and Follow the notes, and they'll tell you why God wrote Ezekiel, which I'm reading right now, and, and what that's all about, and um, various other books of the Bible. But read through it, and as you read through it, let it shine into the dark corners of your heart as it convicts you, and you realize, ooh, yep, that was a dark area. Now there's more light there. And we progressively then come out into the full light of God's truth as we do that. Uh, false believers, and there are some, avoid God's Word. They don't like it because it convicts them of sin. And they find churches that don't preach the Word to expose their sin. They go to feel-good churches. And there are many of them. In fact, the largest church in America is a feel-good church. You'll feel really good after hearing Joel Osteen. Oh, he never talks about sin. Nothing negative. Never about judgment. But he's a false teacher. You see. Remember the story in the Old Testament when Jehoshaphat and Ahab were together? I think Jehoshaphat, he was a godly king, and his true motive was he wanted to see the north and the south reunited. But he was compromising by joining forces with Ahab. And Ahab says, let's go into battle. Will you join me in battle? And, and Jehoshaphat says, well, isn't there a prophet around that we can talk to to see whether or not we should do this? And Ahab says, yeah, there's that guy Micaiah, but I hate him because he always tells evil about me, not good. <laughs> exactly. He had a good reason to talk evil about Ahab because Ahab was evil. And uh, so that's the kind of church you want to avoid. 
But false believers try to keep up a good front outwardly, but they don't allow the Word of God to get down into their heart and their motives. And don't just read the Word, meditate on it. Meditate on it and think about it. And think about how does that apply to me? And what do I need to obey here in this text? J.C. Ryle points out that eventually sinners will get what they desired on earth. He says they love darkness. They're going to be cast into outer darkness. They hated the light. They're going to be shut out from the light eternally. And he points out how God will be perfectly just in condemning those who rejected Christ because they saw the light and they said, no, we prefer darkness. We love our sin. John Piper summarizes our text as follows. He says, the coming of Jesus into the world clarifies that unbelief is our fault and belief is God's gift, which means that if we do not come to Christ but rather perish eternally, we magnify God's justice. And if we do come to Christ and gain eternal life, we magnify God's grace. And my prayer is that all of us will believe in Jesus, that we will rejoice in his light and come to it again and again and again so that we magnify God's grace. Let's pray. Father, you know every heart here. I don't. You know my heart. You know my struggles. You know my sins. You know that of all my brothers and sisters. You know that of some here who are not yet my brothers and sisters because they hate the light. And they're avoiding the light. And I pray that they would see that the light is for their eternal salvation. And that if they love darkness, they stand judged because they're rejecting Jesus who is the light. And that the light brings healing and the light brings eternal life and that you would draw those who are yet in darkness into the light of the glory of the gospel of Christ that they might be saved and I pray Lord as your people we would not dodge hard truth in your word that convicts us but that we would grow by it that we would expose our lives to it that we would Bring every thought captive to obedience to Jesus, that you would help us to be people of light, and that by our very presence in this world, we might shine on those in darkness with the good news that the Savior has come, that he has shown on those who sit in darkness and have no hope, and that they can respond by believing in Jesus and having eternal life. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.